Okay, so I'm Shannon White. I'm the Associate Director of an organization here called Partnership for Safety and Justice. We've been around for about 12 years and we're a statewide advocacy organization and I want to um, tell you a little bit about who we are because it's important to also what I'm going to say today and that is that we have a really unique approach to looking at public safety policy and that we want, believe that we can have a public safety system that does justice both for, for example, kids who are charged as adults in the system or maybe not charged as adults in the system and also for the victims of those crimes. And we believe that actually looking at it from separate places has in some ways gotten us into um, the situation we're in, which is we think a really broken public safety system and that only by really acknowledging the harm done and the person who's done the harm can we actually get to good public safety policy that works best for everyone. Um, and I've, I've been with that organization for four years. As you heard, I've done work um, with the Innocence Project and around juvenile justice reform in Louisiana for many, many years. But this approach um, is, is innovative, and I want to talk to you all a little bit about it before then talking um, a, a little bit more about what happens in Oregon and who gets tried as adults and, and how that's working here. And, and, and because I'm an advocate in fighting for policy change on some hopeful things that I think are happening here that maybe some of you will want to get involved in. And I'm going to do it really quick. So um, first of all, I want to start by telling a, a little bit of a personal story that I hope is helpful in illuminating this perspective that I want to talk to you about, which is that I, in high school and college, did a, a huge amount of volunteering around um, homelessness and ended up um, in the early 90s interning and uh, full-time interning at a homeless shelter in Washington, DC. It was 1,400 people who lived there. Um, and uh, had experiences there with the public safety system that I never imagined. Um, so right there, I'm there because I care about homelessness. I don't want you know, mentally ill living on the streets. I want us to have services for them. And what I end up seeing in Washington, D.C. is that when the people who are homeless, um, particularly are, um, well, obviously they're poor, but the, and majority black, you know, African-American folks in the shelter, but suddenly, there aren't, it's not really a question of services. It was a question of the public safety system interacting with that population, right? So, you know, I once saw a friend of mine who was an, a mentally ill woman in the shelter, and police were at the shelter dealing with someone else, and she started yelling because she's seriously mentally ill. Um, and they just came and beat her, you know, right in front of all of us. Um, and, you know, I grew up in Southwest Portland, and everyone's white in Southwest Portland, and the police are very nice in Southwest Portland, and you call them officer friendly, and they take you home um, <laughs> if you need a ride. And that's not what I saw in Washington. Um, one time I was taking a family, we had moved them into an apartment, and I was driving a van full of people that had, had been the movers. Everyone in the car was black, and I, um, we were just excited, and I took this illegal ride on red on 14th Street, can't take a ride on red between four and six, whatever. I took the ride on red, got pulled over um, for doing it, and so like, okay, I'm gonna get a ticket. And the police officer went to the passenger side, I had a pregnant woman sitting next to me, and he um, put his gun across her lap and pointed it at my head and started screaming at me to get my hands in the air. And I was like, I just took a ride on red. Um, <laughs> anyway, I won't go into the whole story, but I'll say that the rest of what happened with people being thrown out of my car and thrown up against walls, I mean, it was insane. And I, so I kind of shifted then and went, wow, this is what makes me most angry. I don't want to ha live in a country where we have a public safety system that interacts with anyone like that ever, right? And so as I move into that world and I, I get a job with the public defenders here in, in Portland, um, friends are saying, because I've done a lot of work, work around domestic violence and, you know, in shelters and stuff, and they're like, how are you going to the other side? You know, you, you used to be helping these people who are victims and needed your help, and now you're looking for folks who've committed crimes. And I was like, well, it's, it's the same group of people. I mean, our public safety system disproportionately impacts, right, low-income people, people of color, in ways that are incredibly harmful. That's why I'm here. Like it's because I'm trying to help those same folks. Um, I want to change the system that's having such a negative impact on them. So if that makes sense, but I think that, so for me, really the, the it's, we're talking about a problem that we need to address potentially from a whole bunch of different perspectives, but for me, the public safety system was where we do the worst, um, where we fail people the most. 
And um, I read, uh, actually right before we were supposed to come down here, before the snow day, there was an article in the New York Times by Michelle Alexander. Um, I think she's a law professor who's written a book called The New Jim Crow, which is about the prison system. Um, but her article was highlighting a perspective of a woman who thought that we should send everyone to trial so that we could shut the whole system down because the system was so bad. And this woman who had experiences with the system was furious at it and um, wanted it to shut down. Well, the interesting thing about this, this woman, and it doesn't get highlighted in the article, is that what happened to her first was that her son was murdered. And she couldn't cope and she ended up addicted. And I think this goes a little bit to what Marty was saying. There's a huge connection between what we can call trauma, or we can call victimization, and addiction. And addiction, there's a big connection between addiction and being pulled into the criminal justice system, right? Because being an addict is illegal. So she starts out with her son is murdered, and she has no services, no support, no capacity to cope with it. Next thing you know, she's addicted and numbing herself, as Marty said. And that leads to her being in the system. Well, she's the same person, right? So Mary, or whoever she was, is, is, is Mary victim, and then she becomes Mary convict in our, in our eyes. And I'm guessing if you track the way our system invests in Mary, we don't care when her son dies. You know, we don't invest in what, what she needs at that moment to rebuild her life. But we're sure going to pay attention when she um, is committing crimes, and then we might spend, oh, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year, depending on what state you're in, to lock her up. You know, what if we put $50,000 into helping her get through the trauma of the death of her child? And so I tell all those stories because I think right now our public safety conversation is driven by the worst cases, right, around homicides. And in some way, I think part of the reason we've lost a handle on that conversation is because we don't talk about the victims in these cases. And oftentimes, there's a huge overlap that we're not paying attention to. And I think we can do right by everyone in this system and, and make sure that when a serious crime does happen, that we don't um, only say, you know, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, right? There's this, this way that this conversation happens where like the victims' rights people are over here going, Go away for life without parole. <laughs> and you know, the defense people are saying, no, no, the, you know, kids are kids. And we very rarely are having an, an integrated conversation that really reflects who the people are in this system. Um, it gets lost, I think, um, in the conversation, even looking through some of the briefs that were filed in the, in the Supreme Court case um, last month. There was one filed by the um, I don't know, National Association of Victims of Juvenile Lifers. And it just lists the crimes of these juveniles and, and makes them horrific. And you would think those kids had never done anything else in their life but participate in a horrific murder. Um, and on the other side, um, Brian Stevenson, who uh, I love and have huge respect for, and I hope you guys will look at his TED talk that's, that's linked up here because it's a brilliant talk about our criminal justice system. But, but the briefs that, that Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative filed don't talk about um, the, the impact of murder and, uh, and, and, and loss for a family. And I think that puts us in this position where we're no longer able to have a, a real conversation about what our public safety system needs to do. Because really what needs to happen is, for sure, kids who kill need some accountability. I mean, regardless of, of um, well, not regardless of, but including the fact that they are, um, have these developmental issues and trauma issues that need to be addressed. I mean, we don't, there's accountability for killing people, right? That's, that's a reasonable thing to have happen. Um, on the other hand, we also need to say to these victims, you get something out of this. Um, you, we need to help you survive this trauma as well. And I think um, that, that's what we've kind of lost. It's very interesting while this huge prison buildup has happened, um, there have been a, a huge surge in victims' rights, which victims have really wanted to see. But you know what? There hasn't been an investment in victim services. You know, the kids that Marty's evaluating are not, as a result of the victims' rights movement, getting more treatment in their communities to help them recover from trauma and become less likely to commit crimes, right? So it actually, we haven't been on a parallel track. We've left people with their trauma 
more likely to come into addiction, more likely to end up in the criminal justice, justice system, of course, more likely, and this is mostly, of course, for low-income folks who can't afford, um, afford those services, and people of color, which is why our system so disproportionately impacts those groups of folks. So I wanted to throw that out there for you because I think um, we, my organization, um, we have, I should have actually, well, maybe we can add it to the website. We just released a report um, a few months ago called Moving Beyond Sides, and it's really trying to get away from like there's this side and there's that side to the kind of criminal justice policy conversation and that we should be able to come to it from a more comprehensive approach. And so I wanted to take a minute to introduce you to that, although maybe I've taken too many minutes, um, because I think that's how we end up in these conversations about like juvenile life without parole. It's very hard to talk about this issue because often, I mean, sometimes there's felony murder, which is a different situation, but you know, oftentimes there is someone who's been murdered, and that's a very serious crime, and we have to take it incredibly seriously every time we talk about kids who are being convicted of it, right? Because there's a lot of harm and damage that's been done to a family and a community over that murder, and we need to be able to have um, a more, I think, real and honest conversation about what needs to be done to address those situations. Now, in Oregon, as you heard, um, <laughs> In the introduction, it's measure 11 is the way that we um, do our serious, serious sentencing for juveniles. I'm just curious, raise of hands, how many people have heard of measure 11 before you were introduced to it? Okay, I figured there was a fair amount of knowledge about it. So, you know, as you heard, measure 11, the kind of most, um, what makes it such a harsh law and kind of out of sync with everything else Oregon does around juvenile justice, because at least compared to Louisiana, we do things a lot better, um, is that there's the direct file component, which means that if you're charged with any one of these 21 enumerated crimes, and they are person crimes, um, that you are automatically put into the adult criminal justice system, and that, that charge carries a mandatory minimum sentence. Right, so in, in essence, the moment that you've been indicted, kind of your fate is is sealed, right? So there's no discretion anywhere in the process where some states try and insert, even if they have direct file, there might be some other places where you could have reverse waiver hearings or things to kind of check that decision, and we, and we don't currently um, have that. And so um, Oregon, that's the law that is really impacting uh, youth um, in, who get direct file in Oregon and end up charged as adults, and one thing, that I think um, can be forgotten is, you know, there's the first piece of when kids get tried as adults, they can end up in adult jails and adult prisons, right? So in all but 12 Oregon counties, if I get arrested as a juvenile for a Measure 11 offense, I'm gonna be in an adult jail, including here in Eugene. Um, and then I can also end up in an adult prison. And of course, kids are much more likely to become victims of physical and sexual violence when they're in adult correctional um, settings, uh, which has become a huge concern. And the other piece is, and I'm going to move super quickly now, is that kids end up carrying a lifelong felony conviction with them. So if we're talking about ultimately, I mean to me, ultimately the goal of good public safety policy is that we're all going to end up living in safe, strong, healthy communities, right? Folks are going to be working, they're going to have happy families. People with felony convictions are facing huge barriers when they're trying to find housing and employment. It's almost impossible. I know some wonderful folks who've luckily got great educations here in Oregon after getting a Measure 11 conviction, and they you know, have business degrees and stuff, and you know what? They're loading boxes off the back of trucks because they can't get a job doing anything else. So there are very serious consequences to these policies, but now I want to go quickly to the hopeful piece of the story since we're about to run out of time, which is that First of all, and I actually don't know this, are, are law students here um, connected to the Oregon Student Association? Do you know the Oregon Student Association? So the Oregon um, Student Association <laughs> organizes um, thousands and tens of thousands of students all over Oregon, and they did a survey recently of um, the top issues for the students, and they got 11,000 responses from students across the state. First one, tuition. Second one, textbook costs. The third one, mandatory minimum sentences in Oregon. And so I think, and so they are now partnering with us, 
and I would offer any of you if you want to get involved to partner with us to do some work that's really being supported now by a newly created Governor's Commission on Public Safety um, to look not just at juveniles but adults as well, mandatory sentencing, how we allocate our resources. You know, one of the big pushes we're having is, yeah, you know, let's stop sentencing people in, in mandatory ways to huge long sentences save some of that money and maybe put some of that into victim services, addiction and mental health treatment, the kinds of things that actually do make our communities safe, safe and strong. And I will stop there so we can have three minutes of conversation. Thank you. <laughs>